We all remember watching our first Disney Princess movie, whether it was going to see Snow White when it was theatrically re-released in 1993, sitting on the couch in front of the TV as Cinderella filled the screen, or laying awake in bed terrified after witnessing a witch with literally all the powers of hell turn into a dragon and come very close to burning Sleeping Beauty and her entire kingdom to a crisp. Disney princesses are instantly recognizable on an almost universal scale, and they've held the attention of not only kids, but quite a few grown-ass adults for nearly 100 years. If you grew up in America in the 90s and 2000s, you very likely either hosted and or attended a Disney princess party. You probably remember a large percentage of kids dressed as their favorite or most recently released Disney princess during the Halloween parade at your elementary school. You may remember dozens of toy aisles filled with pink packaging containing dolls, dresses, plastic heels, tiaras, cell phones, cash registers, and God only knows what else. But there are probably some Disney princesses you don't remember. I'm talking about the ones who are rarely or even never seen, represented or spoken about, as if they were simply forgotten or in some cases, hidden away from public memory. The Black Cauldron was released in 1985 and almost destroyed Disney, costing between $25 and $40 million to make and grossing only $4 million at the box office. It failed for many reasons. Don Bluth, who I'm thoroughly convinced is cursed, pieced out partway through production and took 13 animators with him. The production ended up being super messy, which resulted in a clumsily told story with choppy editing, and the film was released at a time when it wasn't cool to go see Disney movies when you were a teenager. So you had this incredibly dark animated movie that was too scary for kids and not hip enough for anyone over the age of 10. And if there are any certainties in life, they are death, taxes, and the fact that Disney will distance itself from any movie it produces that isn't a success. Consequently, Princess Ellen Wee is absent from the official Disney lineup, and besides possibly being a walk-around character at the theme park during the film's release, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that official merch has ever even existed. Basically, Ellen Wee isn't profitable, which is one of the actual standards that must be met when considering new members to be welcomed into the Disney Princess franchise, a concept that was the brainchild of Andy Mooney, president of the Walt Disney Company's Disney Consumer Products Division in 1999. After Mooney saw dozens of little girls at a Disney on Ice show dressed in generic princess costumes, marketing genius that he was, he literally really said to his team, okay, let's establish standards and a color palette and get as much product out there as we possibly can that allows these girls to do what they're already doing, projecting themselves into the characters from the classic movies. So what are these standards that he came up with? What does it take to actually get on the official Disney princess list? While Disney hasn't seemed to release any official standards at this time, it does seem that a princess must have human characteristics, star in an animated film, cannot be introduced through a sequel, must be royal by blood, marriage, or especially heroic, and her movie has to be a box office hit. But despite meeting that criteria, there are some princesses that still aren't on that lineup. Anna from Frozen becomes a queen by the second movie, so by that reason alone, many say she doesn't qualify. But another reason may very well be that Frozen was so financially successful with its own merchandise, it simply didn't make sense to put her on the lineup. In the case of Giselle from Enchanted, who was only animated for a whopping 13 minutes, not including her simply came down to the fact that Disney would have had to pay Amy Adams royalties for the rest of her life, and they are simply not about that. And of course, as Vanellope said herself, The code may say I'm a princess, but I know who I really am, Ralph. I'm a racer with the greatest superpower ever! But there's one more very important part of being on the Disney Princess lineup, and that is actually being in an animated Disney film. It's easy to assume that any animated princess movie is one that was created by Disney. For one, many of these animated films were made by ex-employees of the studio, so the animation and overall structure of the movies are very similar to Disney. Then there's the fact that these smaller studio productions seem to have been deliberately made to fail. The Swan Princess was released by New Line Cinema and was, funny enough, directed by Richard Rich, who also directed The Black Cauldron. Rich was then fired by Disney and went on to create his own animation studio with other former Mouse employees, thinking, you know, if Don Bluth can do it, why can't I? The result was a very pretty movie with excellent humor. You should write a book. How to offend women in five syllables or less. And a soundtrack that slapped so hard, the theme song was nominated for a Golden Globe. But, Disney being Disney, made sure to re-release The Lion King at the same time The Swan Princess hit the theaters, so it completely bombed at the box office. Despite the sabotage, The Swan Princess went on to be a hit during its home video release, and since then it's become a cult classic with eight sequels. And it wasn't the only movie to suffer the same fate due to Disney's interference. While Anastasia is now owned by Disney due to them acquiring Fox, she still isn't consistent 
considered a Disney princess, no matter how much people scream at me in the comments, and scream they will. When the Don Bluth-directed film was initially released, Disney re-released The Little Mermaid, debuted Flubber, George of the Jungle, and Hercules. They also banned television advertisements for Anastasia from being aired on the ABC program The Wonderful World of Disney. And of course, when questioned about the interesting timing on their release dates, a spokesperson for Disney said, we always re-release movies around the holidays, we don't know what you're talking about. And Bill Mechanic, the entertainment CEO of Filmed Entertainment, who pitched the idea to adapt the story of Anastasia, called bullshit and said verbatim, it's a deliberate attempt to be a bully, to kick sand in our face. They can't be trying to maximize their own business. The amount they're spending on advertising is ridiculous. It's a concentrated effort to keep our film from fulfilling its potential. So besides Disney making absolutely sure that they have the corner market on all things animated princesses and building their empire on the corpses of the competition, there's also the case of smaller studios creating movies that weren't very well received. Like Thumbelina, another Don Bluth feature, with the titular character portrayed by Jodie Benson, who also played Ariel in Disney's The Little Mermaid. It absolutely tanked at the box office and received mostly negative reviews from critics. Carol Channing's memorable song, Marry the Mole, even won a Razzie that year for worst original song. Mary. And the same went for The Princess and the Goblin. Not only did critics say that it didn't hold up to Disney movies like Aladdin, but it was also competing with the release of The Lion King. It was a commercial and critical failure, quickly fading into obscurity to the point that even the most die-hard animation buffs will only have vague memories of the film. But despite being absolutely eviscerated from every angle, these movies still hold a special place in the hearts of many 90s kids, and speaking as one of those kids, it's usually because we are the weird, fixated ones who carry torches for long-dead franchises. I mean, let's be honest, Thumbelina was a trip. It was weird from the general aesthetic, to the storyline, to that bizarre animation that just seemed a little off. Not as off as The Princess and the Goblin, but still just different. These were the kinds of movies that made you feel funny, but you didn't know why, and you certainly didn't know why you liked it. And now, as an adult, it's easier to recognize how utterly interesting these movies were. That's not to say the beautiful and polished movies that Disney created were uninteresting. In fact, they are the incredible works of art that have historically set the gold standard for animated film. But the movement, the color, and the oddity of these smaller productions was captivating. I think it's the kind of stimuli a lot of artists are drawn to, people with wonderfully different ways of thinking and perceiving the world. All of that being said, I'm not sure if this is even a relevant topic anymore. The era of the princess seems like it might be over, and it might not be a bad thing. The idea of royalty is antiquated birthright bullshit, and people are getting tired of the quirky, adorable princesses that are all just Zoe Deschanel's personality stapled to a 3D model with gigantic baby eyes. It's not enough to just be pretty nice or even relatable. I think this is particularly evident in the box office performance and poor reviews of the movie Wish, which are both, as of this recording, the worst Disney has ever experienced. Audiences, even those audiences who are just kids, want characters with depth or at least characters they haven't seen before. They want characters who actually do something, who are interesting. As someone who works in entertainment, I find it thrilling that people are starting to turn away from these mega production studios and are looking to smaller, independent creators who are producing unique stories and visually captivating animation. And in a world that's being rapidly consumed by AI, it's a much needed little glimmer of hope, so that maybe in the future, artists can preserve and escape from under the thumb of the corporate industry we call Big Princess. If you have any opinions or you learned anything, let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time.